us off today, we have Dr. Jeremiah Brown. And Dr. Brown is joining us from Australia, where he's a research fellow at the Center for Social Impact at the University of South Wales. He's currently working on a range of projects related to the funding of charities and improvement of Australian financial well-being. And today he's going to talk about the importance of recognizing the emotional side of financial hardship when we roll out new products and services and some of the changes we can make to our service design so that we can have a positive impact on the customer relationship through that empathy. Jeremiah, take it away. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be presenting to you today on financial services and customer economic dignity. My name is Jeremiah Brown, and I'm a researcher at the Center for Social Impact at the UNS University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I research on social policy in various forms, uh, and I have a keen interest in financial well-being. Um, so I work on freedom, financial well-being, and the principles that can be used to better ensure that our economies are working for people rather than undermining our ability to live a good life. So today I'm going to talk to you about three things. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the idea of economic dignity and explain what that actually is because it's a bit of a complicated term. Um, the second is to talk to you about how economic dignity can be applied to customer design to start to think about features of design in the products and services being offered. And at the end of my presentation, I'll provide you with some examples I've undertaken work on to examine how economic dignity can be used in practical contexts. And this gives you a sense of the potential places where things can go wrong in relation to economic dignity, and also to give you a sense of um, how you can get it right as well. So, so what good and bad aspects of design might be in relation to economic dignity. Right, so let's start. What is economic dignity, right? Like we've all heard the term dignity, but what actually is it? Do you even know dignity when you see it? Um, well, well the, econ the term and the concept economic dignity is only very recently being coined um, by Gene Sperling. Uh, he's written a really good book, actually, and I, I strongly recommend reading it. Um, the concept's got like a strong history and, and draws from, and particularly in the United States, it draws from people as wide ranging as Charles Dickens through to the speeches of Martin Luther King. The idea is in there, if not the term. Um, and the the idea basically uh, on the way that I construct it has four parts to it. And these draw from the wider concept of dignity. You have the idea of dignity as intrinsic, dignity as status, dignity as function, and dignity as bearing. Um, so I'll explain what I mean by all those, right? So dignity is intrinsic. This is the idea that the dignity that people possess uh, is inherent to them. It's intrinsic to being a person. Um, it's often located in a person's agency um, and it's actually a very important in documents like the Charter of Human Rights. Underlying this notion of dignity is the idea that you should treat everyone with respect and that people should be treated as being capable of making decisions and act, acting freely. So this one's really an ag agency-centered idea and I'll explain later how, how that makes sense for designing uh, products and services. Um, the second idea of dignity is the idea of dignity as status. And this is a form of dignity that has a strong tradition coming from hierarchical societies and where there's status located in different positions. Um, it has come to be associated with various forms of service in the modern context, especially military and public service. You can see the example there of Barack Obama. Um, it's increasingly in our society coming, uh, becoming tied to the notion of wealth. Uh, and, and it's opposite, like on the flip side of the positive aspects of dignity of status, people can be stigmatized for their position. So in hierarchical societies, there's good positions, there's also bad ones. Uh, for economic dignity, a key feature is that people should not be stigmatized based on their economic positions. And unfortunately, we often see strong stigmatization of people in poverty or in areas with low socioeconomic standing. So it's not just the individuals, often it's geographical locations can become stigmatized because of the absence of welfare. The third idea of dignity, and this pulls on the, the notion of dignity as work, or on, on the connection between dignity and, and work, is the idea of dignity as function. And this is the idea that dignity 
can be found in properly fulfilling a role that serves a social function. Um, and this captures the value of, that we attach to serving a valuable function in our society. Um, throughout the pandemic, we've seen public recognition, recognition and valorization of those serving on the front lines, especially nurses. Um, you can see an the example there that this part of dignity means that people should be able to undertake work that is meaningful to them and it's in a safe and fair working conditions. And that's very important. Uh, and I'll come back to what that means for service or for service design later, because there are implications for service design from that idea. Um, and then the, the fourth idea is uh, of dignity is the notion of dignity as bearing. Um, this is the, uh, the dignity that's attributed to someone who acts in a dignified manner. Um, it applies to the way our carry, we carry ourselves and the actions that we undertake. It's generally understood through the idea of there being something valuable when people do the right thing and on the opposite side, something harmful when people do the wrong thing. And when people are placed in situations where they have insufficient resources to meet their essential needs, a special kind of harm happens to them where they're they have to participate in their own deprivation. And for example, when a person has to choose between whether they take their medication or they skip meals to be able to afford their medication, they have to actively deprive themselves of one of those essential things, whether it's food or their medication. And this can, over the longer term, undermine a person's sense of self and um, their sense that they're entitled to these essential uh, things and and it can lead to significant ne ne lead to significant negative mental health outcomes. So you might be thinking, what does all this high level theory about dignity have to do with service design? Well, actually, I'd argue it's pretty important when it comes to customer well-being. I'm going to walk through what it means now for you in the context of how you might improve your service design and user experience. And I always say that small shifts can have big impacts when you're living with swim, slim margins. So small tweaks in your service delivery might have or, or service design might have a big positive impact on some of your customers. Um, and it's particularly when things go a little bit wrong that these these uh, the, the role that economic dignity plays becomes more important, right? So um, for the first part of economic dignity, that's dignity is intrinsic, there are a couple of key ideas to be keeping in mind. The first aspect is to make products and services as easy to understand as possible. Often we see with like products or services, when they're offered, they're offered in ways that are either deliberately complicated, they're steeped in legalese and jargon, or which don't reflect the normal customer experience. Um, supporting and respecting the agency of people means providing them with the means to make informed choices. It also means ensuring that the product and the services being provided actually align with what the person wants. So not engaging in any predatory selling practices. And I just want to stress that idea of it's about informed um, choices. So like ensuring that the information available is accurate and reflects what it does. Um, a person might make a choice that is uh, informed from their perspective in the sense that they have seen information and acted on that information. But if the information isn't accurate, that's actually undermining their agency. Right. So the, the second part of dig dignity or economic dignity is that has service implications, the notion of dignity as status. Now, often the opposite of dignity as status is the idea of stigmatization and it's based on rank or position. So to, to support this kind of dignity, it's important to ensure that services are accessible and support the wider community. Um, in South America at the moment, there's a push to provide services for many historically excluded groups by making products that specifically cater to the needs of lower income and less wealthy households. This has the potential to be mutually beneficial as well. So for example, the FinTech um, Wala has been hugely successful by targeting the unbanked and designing services to specifically meet their needs. Um, supporting this form of economic dignity also means ensuring that the services offered 
are physically accessible. Um, while there's a growing shift away from in-store service delivery models, uh, we, we know that less wealthy neighborhoods in the US and around the world, in fact, tend to be underserved for their financial needs. And this has important implications for their financial well-being in terms of the products and services that are actually available to them. So we see uh, often predatory lenders take up residents in those areas in part because they're underserved through more mainstream banking. Um, so the physical location is actually important as well. And then through the third part of economic, economic dignity, uh, dignity as function, the implications are really important for the support structures available for products. So again, I stressed before that like, if things go perfectly, then it's it may be fine. You don't need to worry so much about your support services. But if something goes wrong, um, accessibility to support is actually quite important. And for people in need of customer support, they may need to access support services outside of hours. Um, We've seen the way that financial considerations can factor into things like whether people perceive themselves as able to get the vaccine for coronavirus, right? They, they need to take time off to, to from their job to go and get the vaccine. And that has a, an, a financial cost associated with it that is... Um, in, they, they see as being something that they can't bear. So even though they're willing to get the vaccine, they, they don't go and do it. Um, for people without paid leave, not having services available outside of their working hours comes as a significant financial cost to them as they need to take time off work to asset access the support that they need. Similarly, for people with complex caring responsibilities, it may be difficult to access or get to customer support when it's needed if it's not available um, in the times when, when they have time to, to access it. We've all had the experience of running through a website, trying to find the right solution to our problem, or we've tried to call for customer support only to be told that the service is hours long um, to access it. So supporting people to be able to participate and serve a function that they have reason to, to value in the economy means that accessing support isn't disruptive to their lives. And this is quite important. Um, and then the, the fourth um, idea of dignity is through dignity as bearing. Um, it's through the idea of how to support customers when things go wrong. Now, what I was talking about before may be more to do with if there's problems in the, the, the product delivery versus on this side, it's more about if things have gone wrong on the customer's side. So uh, a key part of supporting this kind of dignity involves minimizing the points where stress experienced by customers who are having financial issues. So one way to do this is to be proactive with the engagement with customers who might be at risk of financial hardship. And this can help avoid, avoid situations where payment defaults happen or where customers ex are experiencing or, or at risk of and then go on to experience significant financial issues. Um, so often customers at risk of financial hardship aren't aware that there may be help available to them. So they, they go through it alone. Um, and instead of having to go it alone um, and try and find the support through a convoluted series of web pages, having easy to access support can make a world of difference. And another way to increase support for this kind of economic dignity is to ensure that forms, so like the paper-based forms that you need to fill out when you do things are minimized and that customer service is personalized and that people speak to a real person when they need assistance. Um, when dealing with complex and difficult issues, being presented with mountains of forms and uh, mountains of paperwork can be overwhelming for people. Uh, and, and instead of completing the form to access the support, some number of people will just not do it and they'll push it off to the side and, and deal with it later. And then, and then they never actually get around to doing it. So making it as easy as possible for customers to access help ensures that those in need of, of that help will be most likely to take it up. And it also reduces stress for people during a difficult period. So 
that's a rundown of how it can help you in theory, but what does this look like in practice? Um, I'm just quickly going to go through um, some of the ways I've recently used the, the concept of economic dignity um, on a recent project that was evaluating service delivery in particular. Um, so my organisation, CSI, recently undertook a review for the Australian National Mental Health Commission on the accessibility of the Australian social security system for people experiencing mental ill health. Uh, and a key feature of the project was using economic dignity as a framework to interpret the accessibility of the system uh, based upon applicant feedback for their experiences of using the system and, and a range of other sources as well. Um, so the key questions we were looking at was whether the service was fit for purpose um, for those needing to access the service. And to do that, we looked at a range of different things, including the three I've got listed here. So um, does the process currently support the intrinsic dignity of people by treating them as a capable agent? Um, is the service designed currently um, to support people with complex needs and do recipients receive adequate support to meet their essential needs? Uh, and, and on that first question, Australia's social security system has a number of behavioural conditions and requirements for recipients. Um, so for your own services, you might think about whether there are specific restrictions placed on contracts that might be unnecessarily restrictive on consumer behaviour. For example, through cancellation clauses that might be unduly punitive. Um, on, the, on the second question, um, was the support provided adequate? Well, we found that it wasn't, um, and it wasn't adequate in terms both of the, of the resources, so the money that people receive for payments, um, and it also wasn't adequate in terms of the help that was available to people. The system was quite inflexible, and accessing things like phone assistance is also incredibly difficult. So, um, that similar to the example I gave before, it was multiple hours of call wait times to speak to someone and that, that can result in payment issues for people and it can result in a number of financial problems for people as a consequence of those payment issues because their payment gets delayed um, and then they can't access the, the service that they need. Um, and then thirdly, does the service design support people with complex needs and we found that there were significant issues with this this was um maybe the, the this was the most important part of the project in terms of also how you might be thinking about your things so as, as i or thinking about service design as I highlighted before, ensuring accessibility to service and and the support for those services when especially when things go wrong is critical. Often systems are designed on the assumption that nothing goes wrong. Unfortunately though, things do go wrong and the hallmarks of good customer-centered design are how effectively the needs of customers are met when things go wrong. For customers in the study we did, the consequences of the lack of accessibility of appropriate supports were serious. Like I won't go into the specifics of Australian social security law, but one issue that is applicable for fintech design is the way that disclosure of mental ill health is often challenging for those in experiencing it. Um, and especially for people with whom uh, there's, there's not an established relationship. So if you have a customer experiencing issues that impact their service needs, they might also be in a situation where they don't wanna talk about it or disclose it at all. And the easier you make that process, for example, by limiting the kind of evidence required to, to obtain that sort of support, it can be an important factor in whether people will uptake a service. And that's actually something that a, a different project, uh, a different program, called NAB Assist does. So NAB Assist is a financial hardship program run by one of Australia's big four banks. And I've actually done some work for this bank uh, previously, but there's no form required for people to apply for the support that's available through NAB Assist. They just talk to a trained NAB employee, one who's trained to speak to financially vulnerable customers. And then if they meet the requirements uh, for, for the service, they get access to the low or no interest loan support that the program offers um, to help them through their financial issue. A key feature of it is that there's not a lot of questions. Um, the, the person doesn't feel like there's an intrusive process that is both attacking their sense of uh, agency by questioning all their decisions. And it also um, doesn't pry into the, their, their personal issues at great length. And so it's it's a relatively pain-free process for people. Um, so 
I'll finish up there, but just some key takeaways for you. Um, treating people with economic dignity is about aligning the services you're offering with the needs of your customers. It means ensuring that you provide them with the right information so that they make informed choices. And I stressed that point before um, about your products. So it means ensuring that services are accessible for all customers and that support is accessible as well. It means ensuring that you cater to the needs of your customers. It's not always about selling things. Sometimes the products you are offering won't align with a potential customer. And that's actually totally fine. You might want or need to expand the services you offer to meet their needs, but it might also mean that you direct them to a service that better fits with their needs. You sometimes need to think about financial well-being and the, and the products and services available as part of a wider ecosystem in that, in that regard. Um, and a key factor in the GFC was the selling of products that did not align with the needs of customers and in fact were deeply harmful to them. Australia just had a banking royal commission in 2019 highlighting these same issues of selling products that customers didn't need. Um, so you want to try and avoid that. Um, and, and then yeah, I, I look forward to your questions and discussing how economic dignity might assist you in improving fintech design in the ways that help you and your customers. Uh, yeah, so thanks for your attention. Uh, and if you'd like to get in contact with me uh, outside of the conference, that's my work email and I'm pretty active on Twitter, so you'll find me there too. Thanks. Jeremiah, thanks so much for leading us off. No worries. Yeah, no, I, it's such a fascinating and important topic and one that's it's so relevant, especially kind of given the tumultuous economic conditions of the past, you know, 18 months or so. So, so really, really important, absolutely. And I, and I do have to give you credit too for, for staying awake. Um, I'm not, what time is it in Australia right now? Uh, it's just about 2 a.m. So it's like, what, 1.40? Yeah, so middle of the night well, for me. I yeah, stayed well, up like excited really, and had some. Really. It's like when you're a kid I'm waiting, staying up for Christmas. So I'm, I'm excited and ready right. for some questions. Awesome, awesome. Well, we will get into that now. We'll, we'll get you out of here and get you to bed. Um, or if you want to do an all-nighter with us, we, we welcome that too. <laughs> but as a reminder as well, just... For everyone attending, um, you can submit your questions through the Q&A, um, so feel free to add that there um, if you want. But Jeremiah, I guess to start off, you know, you talked about this idea of embedding service design in a way, and, and you kind of had a quote there that I really like, kind of small shifts can have big impacts when you're working with slim margins, and I love that. Um, and I know this kind of embedding this accessibility can feel like a huge challenge if you haven't started thinking this way. So do you have any kind of, I guess, tips on how organizations can start doing that or at least start thinking about you know making those changes um you kind of talked about it when in in that example you gave in the intro where you mentioned the idea of nothing about us without us well you have to sometimes like think about and go and talk to the groups what what do they want what fits in with um their needs as a consumer um, so yeah, when, when you're doing product design, particularly for groups that you think might have accessibility challenges, actually talking to them about it is the best way to make those services accessible for them. It sounds simple, but actually I think sometimes people just jump the gun and go straight to providing the answer themselves instead of actually, what does this person, what will help them the most? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. No, so important to kind of remember to put the customer kind of at the center of things. And at the beginning of things, right? Like that's that's kind of a, a really important way to approach it. Um, is that kind of, as, as you approach that with Australian Social Security, how did you think about that with the Australian customer base in, in terms of evaluating, you know, what their needs were before thinking about the actual products we're putting out for them? Yeah, so there's kind of a, a mixture of things that, that come together there. The first thing is you want to be thinking about, um, on the first count, like what does everyone need? And that's where that like basic idea of, if you're thinking about um, intrinsic economic dignity, there are certain things that support um, people having choices and certain things that undermine it. Um, but then it's also about thinking about the specific needs of that group. So I didn't mention it in the talk, but one of the things that is 
a significant challenge for people who experience mental ill health. Um, and this isn't just in Australia, this is around the world. Um, the challenge is that a lot of uh, the issues are episodic. They're not, um, it's not ex experienced as a stable singular event. It's like it occurs at irregular moments. And so for them, product and service design actually needs to be able to handle periods of time where things are fine and then deal with that moment where something goes wrong for a little bit and they need that extra support. Um, but often our, our standard default thing is we like things constant um, when we set them up. We like the same sort of service, but that, that's actually like, yeah, one of those things that if you're paying attention to the group, you'll notice, oh, this is a particular feature that needs to be accounted for to make it accessible for them. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. If we've learned anything over the past 18 months is that things change and things change quickly. Um, so super important. So we do have a, a, a question here. Um, how can companies or individuals spur governmental changes toward widespread economic dignity programs? Use universal basic income as an example. Um, I think there's, there's a couple of parts to that. If we think about it from the company side, actually, um, supporting uh you if you remember when i talked about the economic dignity is bearing well actually supporting people so that they have an adequate income through something like um, ubi is a really helpful way for the individual but it also on the flip side has benefits for companies um there's a lot of work that's been done in, in the australian context that highlighted we we had really high um boost to social security payments during the pandemic. So we had, it's called the coronavirus supplement that basically doubled um, your social security payments. I, I won't go into how the complexities of our and differences between Australian and US social security, but um, th the impact was actually a real positive for a lot of businesses because um, low income households in particular actually spend a much higher proportion of their income if if they see increases to it because they've got unmet needs that they need to or they're looking to spend but they can't afford to a lot of the time um so actually for a lot of companies increasing support available to people whether it's through a ubi or the social security system will actually be beneficial in terms of the services and products that they're then able to provide to people Totally. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can definitely, you can do well and you can do good at the same time. And I think, I think we saw that a little yeah. bit in the United States, certainly with the, with the PPP program um, that we had here. So one more topic that I kind of want to just, you know, hear from you on is, you know, the audience here, it's a lot of people leaders. And I'm curious, have you looked at, you know, dignity as a function and how we as leaders and employers can kind of promote employees to feel or have dignity in their roles? Yeah. So, um, a central feature about that, if we sort of talk about that third component in terms of seeing a valuable function, it's being very active as a leader if you're working with team members and talking to them about the kinds of things that they're most interested in and working on and giving them a little bit of agency in maybe there's, you know, four projects that the team's got going on and that person's interested in two of those particular projects. You might not be able to put them on the one that's their highest, like the, the one that they most want to do, but then the second most they might be able to find. So offering people the capacity to have a bit of agency in what they do, so how they can choose things, but also then putting it in, in the ones that they're, they're most interested in can have a big impact in terms of how they feel about the work they're doing. Instead of, you know, just doing something for someone else, you feel like you're coming in and you're in control of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Control is so important. At least that, you know, feeling that you have control of your own situation is, is so important. Um, another question here, um, how important is language and the use of language in economic dignity, especially as you know, we have designers and copywriters and folks who are working with language every day, certainly in the audience here. Yeah, language is actually critical. So you wouldn't have seen this across the pond very far away, but um, yesterday there was a really, uh, it was panned everywhere. There was a piece that was very critical. It talked about the underclass in Australia and it was like, yeah, use really negative language. Um, and it produced a lot of stigma. Um, like the, the piece was talking about harnessing the underclass was the kind of the, the key theme, which was, I thought was beyond the pale. But um, the, the point is that 
depending on how you talk about these things, if you remember dignity of status, you can both like, you can lift people up, you can talk about them in a really positive way. But if you talk about things in a negative manner, or if you frame things in ways that suggest failure in people, um, it can have a really negative consequence for them. Um, and, and it can be very harmful to how they think about themselves, but it can also just generally stigmatize that group. It can lead to um, lack of social engagement or social participation or kinds of things like that. So language is yeah. yet really important. Totally. Well, a, a lot of really good thoughts here. Um, and as a reminder to everyone attending, you can access Jeremiah's presentation and the presentations for all speakers in the links in the agenda below. So you can scroll down and, and look at those. And one more tip too, just with the interface, I didn't mention this at the beginning. Um, you can sort that ideas tab by most recent rather than most popular if you prefer that view. So, but Jeremiah, we will let you go. Thank you so much for being here um, and kicking things off. We, we really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.